Society is not the only one who needs to change. And everybody wants to change the schools and everybody wants to change the political climate. But what would happen if the church quit saying everybody else needs to change and the church started saying, what do you want to do in me today, God? Right now, right here, how do you want me to change me from the inside out? Philippians chapter 4, verse 6. Let's read together. Be anxious for nothing. Read out loud. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God. We said last week, come on, say it with me, 3, 2, 1. Anxiety. Come on, be anxious. Oh, you got it. Anxiety is not my identity. Be anxious. Father, I pray that we'd get this today. I pray, God, that you would eradicate anxious thoughts and anxiety from the hearts of hurting people who love you today, God. God, do what only you can do in this moment. God, we're not here. We're not here for good preaching. We're not here for good music. We're not here for programs. God, we're here today for you because of you. God, we need you, but we don't just need you. Pray it. Come on. We want you, God. We don't, of course, we need you, but we don't just need you. Say it again. God, we want you. We want your reign. We want your rule. We want your government. We want you to govern our heart, our thoughts, our soul, our mind, will, intellect, appetites, desires, and emotions. We want you to rule us, Almighty God. Our life will be so much better if you are in charge. So, God, take charge today and mold us into the image of Jesus. In Christ's name I pray, amen. Now, last week and, and every week, we want people to walk out of here encouraged. But we encouraged you last week with the thought, anxiety is not my identity. And we, we dabbled in Galatians chapter 2, verse 20, in the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God. This is who you are. If you have not listened to the message from last week, you need, you need don't stop what you're doing and go do it now, but you need to listen to the message from last week because it will set you up. The last three weeks will set you up for the message today. We started this four weeks ago in verse 1, and we talked about the two ladies that couldn't get it along. Y'all remember them? Yoda and uh, Sintik. Y'all don't remember her. So anyways, go read your Bibles in verse 1 through 3. These ladies can't get along. And Paul says things like rejoice in the Lord. He says, hey, help these two ladies get along in the church. I mean, how, how bad would that be for all eternity? You've been called out for your gossip and struggles, right? Two women in the church. And Paul calls them out and, and asks one of his uh, companions to help, him, help them get along. And then he talks about let your gentleness be made known to all men. And this verse alone has been impacting my life. Let your gentleness be made known to all men. I have found myself stopping myself mid-sentence. I have found myself stopping myself in conversations and even in my thought life and saying, Ken Height, that's not gentle. Ken Height, that is not letting your gentleness be made known to all men. And I'm like, well, I don't feel gentle. And the Holy Spirit's like, I know it's because you're rebellious. And the Holy Spirit's trying to produce in me and in you too love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness. Watch this, gentleness and self-control. Let your gentleness, you know what he's saying? Let the whole world see what the Holy Spirit's doing in your life. That's what God is saying. And then he says, he says, rejoice in the Lord. And again I say rejoice. And we're supposed to have lives full of joy. So, so let's not trade our joy for anxious thoughts and anxiety. And we talked about how we pray, and we talked about that we should turn our anxiety and turn our anxious thoughts into, 
Thank you. We turn our anxiety, turn my mic up, and, I'll, and I, prom- I won't yell as much. <clears throat> we turn our anxiety into, come on, say it. We turn our anxiety into, you're going to think about something. And you're going to be tired of thinking at the end of the day. You're going to be tired. Your mind's going to be tired. You're either going to be tired because you exhausted yourself in worry, which produces nothing, or because you exhausted yourself in prayer, which brings supernatural change to your life. That's where we want to live. And then we said in verse 8, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are lovely. We went down that list. There are six things. And then he says, if there's anything excellent, if there's anything praiseworthy, he said, think on these things. That's what the King James says, the, the, uh, the NASB says, dwell on these things. So in other words, we're going to set up camp. We're going to build our house there. And we're going to live in that place where we dwell on the right things. What we don't want to do is dwell on all the peripheral things that don't matter, many things that are never going to happen anyways, things that just make us worried and anxious, keep us up late at night, and, uh, and ruin and destroy our families and our most important relationships. S- some of you didn't get a divorce because your spouse was bad or you were a bad spouse. Some of you may have struggled through a divorce because your, your uh, relationship was uh, mangled up by anxiety and worry and anxious thoughts. And your wife's always worried about why you came home late. And your wife's always worried about where you are. And you get tired of that. Or vice versa. It doesn't have to be the wife. You may have a jealous husband. And it's not that he doesn't know how to be a husband. It's not that he doesn't care about you. Or he doesn't want to be a good husband. But because he's so jealous. And you can't come home two minutes late without him wondering where you were. And checking Life 360. And wanting to know what's going on in your life. And at some point, you get tired of that. And now your relationships even can be destroyed. <clears throat> your careers can be destroyed over anxious thoughts and anxiety because so much of it is not even true. So what we want to do is we want to dwell on the right things. And then I said that we would get here this week. Now, verse 9, I've been waiting to get to verse 9. I'm super excited about verse 9, but let's just read verse 8 real fast. We already read, uh, we already read, verse, we already read verse 6 and 7. And now we're going to read verse nine, uh, verse eight and nine. Let's read together. Three, two, one. Finally, brethren. If there's any excellence, what? Dwell on these things. <clears throat> Dwell on these things. And then verse 9, I want you to read this out loud. He says, the things you have, okay, I want to stop right there. If your mind's not right, you're never going to learn anything. You've got to get your mind right. And some of you want to progress, but the reason you can't progress is because you haven't changed the way you think. And the only way to change the way you think is to get in the presence of God and have your mind renewed. You see, for the Christian believer, we have the mind of Christ. God doesn't want us thinking like the world wants to think. Chris Hodges said in his recent podcast, if you want to make a difference, then you have to be different. And a Christian's mind has to be different than the mind of the world. Our jokes are not the same as the world. The things that we think are funny as believers in Jesus, now I'm not going to say that, that the world has no humor, Because there are comedic geniuses who don't know Jesus. And there's some things that you have to choose not to laugh at. See, some of you, when I say that, you're like, oh, well, I can't help it if it's funny. Well, you can help it if your mind is right. There's some stuff you don't want your 15-year-old daughter joking about. Man, are y'all still here? There's, there's some things you don't want your 16-year-old son to be joking about. There's some stuff they're not ready to joke. They're not ready to know about. And so we got to get our minds right so that we can learn. And, and our minds should be different from the minds of people in the world. All right, keep reading. The things that you have learned and received and, and where? Where? Okay, hold on. Let's do it again. The things that you have and and. And where? 
Who's he talking about? He's talking about that. Well, that right there is Paul. This is Paul. So Paul's saying the things that you have learned and received and heard and seen where? Who's he talking about? Himself. He's talking about himself. I want you to think about something. Paul says things like, follow me as I follow Christ. One of the commentators that I read from, Vernon McGee, he said he didn't even want his own grandson following in his pathway. And this is a guy who's writing commentaries. Now I want to ask you a question. If the guy who's writing commentaries about the Bible isn't sure if he wants his own grandson, this is a guy who studies the Bible, who knows the Bible. Uh, if that guy is not even sure if he wants his own grandson to follow in the pathway that he took, uh, does anybody in the room even begin to understand how big this is for Paul to say, do what I do? And would you be comfortable as a believer in Jesus telling your co-workers or telling your, your spouse or your children or telling your family or telling, uh, telling the people who work for you, would you be comfortable telling them, well, if you want to see how Jesus acts, just watch how I act? Would you be comfortable with that? Because I'm, I'm not like it 100%, I can tell you that. <laughs> so, so when Paul says this, Paul says things like, follow me as I follow Christ. These are big words. And I just want to say to everybody, 2,000 years ago, okay, uh, 1,900 years ago, they weren't arguing over New Living Translation, NASB, is it the 95, the 77, or the 2020? Is it the KJV, the new KJV? Is it, the, is it this Bible? Is it that translation? Are you hearing what I'm saying? They weren't arguing about any of that stuff. You know why? They didn't have them. They didn't have a new American Standard Bible. They didn't have a 1995 update from the 77. They didn't have a 2020 update from the 1995. They didn't have an NIV. They didn't have an NLT. They didn't have an International Children's Bible. They didn't have all that stuff. Do you know what they were talking a lot about? Did you hear about this guy named Jesus of Nazareth who was born of a virgin, who died for the sins of the world? God raised him from the dead, and he's coming back again. That's what they were talking about. Jesus risen from the dead, which is why Paul says, if Jesus be not risen from the dead, then all our preaching is in vain and our faith is in vain. You know what that means? They must have been preaching an awful lot about Jesus being raised from the dead. And when we're singing this song, I've seen it in my own life. Uh, I've, what's the next word? I've seen it with my own eyes. I've seen it in my own life. When we, when we sing that, you know why you've seen it in your own life? Not because you picked the right Bible translation. You've seen it in your own life because Jesus has risen from the dead. That's why you've seen it in your own life. Not because you're so smart, not because you're so studious and scholarly, but because Jesus was dead and now he's alive and he ascended to sit at the right hand of Almighty God and he's making intercession for us. This is why you see it in your own life. He said, the things that you've learned and received and heard and seen in me, I love this. In the King James, he just says, do it. So you could preach a sermon from the King James called, just do it. But this right here, he says, read that word. What's it say? Oh, my. Read the whole phrase. Practice these things. Now, if you look, if you look at uh, verse 8, it says, finally, whatever is true. I, I, if I'm not mistaken, uh, if I'm not mistaken in the King James, it says, whatsoever things are true. Uh, but this one here says, whatever is true. But then down at the bottom, he says, dwell on what? These things. And over here, he says, practice these things. So I want you to understand that these things are these things. He says, 
practice these things. And what's the promise connected? Come on, we're doing Bible study. What's the promise connected to the command? He didn't ask if your opinion uh, was for it or against it. He didn't say, hey, if this makes sense to you and your denomination, then practice these things. He didn't say, if you like it, if you appreciate it, if it makes sense to you, if you comprehend it, if you grasp it. He said, do it. Practice these things. And, oh, thank God for the ands in Scripture. Thank God for the therefores and the if-thens. He says, practice these things and what? Read it. Not just the peace of God, but the God who shows up and brings peace with him. He will walk with you. He will be with you. And he will never leave you nor forsake you. Man, I don't know about y'all, but already I want to practice these things. This is how you think. This is how you live. If you're taking notes somewhere off to the right of this, you want to put that down. Think like this. Live like this. Oh, come on. I want y'all to say it with me. Put it on the screen for them. Think like this and live like this. Come on, let's say it again. You ready? Think like this. Live like this. Whatsoever things are true, come on, if we go down that list and we dwell on these things, then we can practice these, th these things and experience the peace of God in our lives. Now, then we, we talked about Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. And we said, and I already quoted a part of it, so we're not even going to go there. But that's who you are. That's who you are. And, and I just want to say this. I want to say this. He says, he says right here, the things that you have learned, received, heard, and seen in me, practice these things, and the God of peace. And how many have ever played on a, on a team that required practice? What happens when you don't practice? You suck. <laughs> That's what happens. I know that you got the ribbon for eighth place. No, you suck. You just suck. You're terrible. You're not good. Come on, you don't play good. You don't catch the ball good. You drop the ball in left field. Come on, you're not good. You're terrible. You know why? You don't practice. We're raising a generation. We have to teach them how to practice. Don't teach them how to feel better because they suck. Only teach them, hey, bud, you can do better. How, dad? Well, you should practice. I don't want to practice. Well, then you're going to suck. Am I right? But if we teach people how to practice, then they're going to play with excellence. They're going to play well. you got to practice. No practice, no peace. That's it. If you will learn to know practice in your life, then you can know peace in your life. But if you do not practice these things, then you can't. No peace. There is no way that you can set your mind on the flesh. There is no way that you can set your mind on the flesh and not experience death. But the mindset on the spirit is life and peace. The mindset on the spirit is life and if we if we if we get our mind right, this is this is the way we think. This is the way we live. And we practice these things. Everybody say the title with me. No practice. No. Come on, say it again. But this time I want you to say it with a spirit of faith like you believe God's going to bring peace to pass in your life. You ready? Three, two, one. No practice. All right. So Paul says there are, there are a couple things here. <clears throat> The things that you have learned and received and the things that you have heard and seen. Now there are, if, you're, if you take notes in your Bible, which you can, and, and I would say do that. You should do that. Underline those four things. Now in my Bible, don't make fun of me. Oh, you're going to make fun of me probably no matter what. But in my Bible, somebody said, yeah. And so in, in my Bible... I underline everything that's a list 
in orange. And I underlined scriptures that are about healing in blue. And I have, I have, I, I nerd out over this. But you know what? If you want to have peace, you'll learn to nerd out over the right things. I don't feed off of negativity. I don't feed off of resentment and offense. You know, part of the reason you have no peace is because you're offended at 80% of the people in your life. And you hold them to expectations you don't yourself fulfill in their life. And you're miserable. Sorry, that was free. That wasn't even part of the message. And so we want to get free from all of that stuff. And so I underline lists in orange in my Bible. And it's just one way for me to know. I have a, a little key in my New Testament that, uh, that I, I have a key at the front of my New Testament in my side margin Bible. And I, I have this whole key of how uh, anywhere there's love, I draw a red heart. I know, I know. It may not sound manly, but that's what I do. And so it must be manly then. And so it's it's what you should do. And so I, I, I underline things. Well, if you were going to underline a list in verse 8, what would your list, what would your list consist of in verse 8? Now there's, in, in my click this past week, we, it was our last week, and we talked about, uh, we talked about there's eight things there, but some commentators say there's a list of six and then two things that describe the six. And some people said, no, there's a list of eight things. And I'd be curious if you do your own, the hard work of heart work, and then tell me what you think. Is there a list of eight or is there a list of six with two descriptors of the six things on the list? That's in verse eight. Come on. Now, don't lose your train of thought. We're not doing that right now. You can do that in your own time. But what would the list be in verse nine? We know what the list is over here. Where is the list in verse 9? All right, y'all copy off of those smart people. All right, what is the list in verse 9? Learned, received, heard, and seen. And it's so weird that there's, there's, there's uh, and in between all of those. There's not commas. I, I personally think that these first two are lumped together. Learned and received are lumped together, and heard and seen are lumped together. So if you were taking notes on that, you'd underline those two things, and you might, you might put brackets or some way to distinguish that those two things are aligned. Because you receive something that, you, you receive something that you've learned, and heard and seen are something that, require, that uh, use both your ears and your eyes. And so it just kind of makes sense to me to put them that way. Now, you may not see it that way, but I got them on the screen that way, and hopefully that's going to help you. The things that you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things. And Paul said, I receive, for I receive from the Lord, this is 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 23, that which I also delivered to you. This is when that Jesus on the night in which he was betrayed, he took bread. And this is when he's talking about communion. In other words, Paul had something that he delivered to people. He had something. And we at Discover Life, as believers in Jesus, we have something that we have to share with the world. Are you hearing what I'm saying? This, this right here is where you make, I would say this is where you make the choice over in verse 8. This is where you make the choice to be doers of the word and not merely hearers of the word. And this is where you do the choice that you made in verse 8. In other words, I'm, and, and listen, I'm not going to worry. I'm not going to be anxious because I make my mind up. I'm not going to do it. The Bible says be anxious. So because the Bible says be anxious, I'm going to be anxious. Because the Bible says, be anxious. I'm going to be anxious, and this is where I make my choice. I'm going to practice these things. Are you hearing what I'm saying? All right. Now, we cannot deliver the gospel until we display the gospel. At some point, your creeds have to turn into conduct. At some point, at some point... Your professions have to turn into performance. At some point, you have to go from talking this thing to walking this thing. 
at some point, you can't just say, oh, just trust me on this. No, no, no. At some point, you've got to say, hey, here's what I believe, and here's how this is affecting my life. Now, there are four things, and I want us to put these four things up here, right here in the dead center. Learned, receive. So this is what we do. If you're taking notes, I want you to write this down. We learn, we receive. Come on, read it with me. We learn, we receive, we hear, and we see. We learn, we receive, we hear, and we see. And let me just say this. We're going to have to humble our hearts. You will not learn anything if you already know everything. And I literally was talking to someone recently. Now, this is actually a joke. It's kind of funny to think about. But we were talking about, so we were talking about water. Water is good for you. Drink lots of water. Like, you should drink water. This, this is recent. This is last night. This is funny. Somebody at my house. You have, you have to drink water. Yeah, but why? 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 This is the person <laughs> said to me. Why do I need to drink water? I'm good. Okay, water is good for you. Water's good for you. No, 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 I, I don't really like it. Give me some Kool-Aid. Well, okay, well, Kool-Aid will give you diabetes. So you need some water. Come on, say amen to that. That's smart preaching. You need some water. You have to choose. Come on, you're here today. You know who I'm talking to. You have to choose to do the right thing at some point. Say amen to this. You cannot learn if you already know it all. You cannot receive if you don't see anything worth receiving. You cannot hear if you close your ears, and you cannot see if you close your eyes. I am submitting to you that there are things God has wanted to do in your life that he couldn't because you have your eyes shut. I'm submitting that there are things that God wants to do in your life. You have no vision for your life. You have no vision for your finances. Your, your version of vision for your finances is God rescue me out of this terrible situation and give me a million dollars. But you can't handle one dollar. And if you can't handle ten dollars, what in the world? You'd kill yourself with a million dollars. Money doesn't change who you are. Money amplifies who you are. Money makes you more of what you are already. And so there's some things we've closed our eyes to, some things we've closed our ears to. How many could think of something right now over that? Because it does mean no good to teach you something that you don't digest and apply to your life. Let's get as practical as possible. I want to ask you a question. Right now in the last six months, can anybody in this room and anybody online watching, can you think of at least one or two things that you know you've shut your eyes to? Can you think of at least one or two things that you know you have closed your ears to? Can you think of one or two things that you know in the last six months that you were supposed to receive that you didn't receive for whatever reason it is, I don't know, or something that you know you were supposed to learn that you didn't have a teachable spirit? My granddad, I thank God for my granddad's, they, they would both quote scriptures to me, but one of my granddads quoted it with an attitude. One of my granddads quoted the Bible with this, with this gracious spirit of love. And then my other granddad quoted the Bible with like a finger pointed and like, you better fear God, kid. And both of them were right because the fear of God, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, right? And God is love. And so I'm thankful for the balance that I have between these two men. But one of my grandfathers used to quote, uh, used to quote the scripture that says, he who hardeneth his neck after much reproof shall suddenly be destroyed and that without remedy. You can only harden your neck so long about something. At some point, you've got to hear. At some point, you've got to see. At some point, you've got to receive. At some point, you've got to learn. And I just want to say today, I believe this is a prophetic utterance into many people's life, my own included, that we need to start receiving and learning and hearing and seeing. Open our eyes to God's vision for our family. Open your eyes. See, you're, you've, got, you've got your spouses. Hold on. Let's talk to singles. You've got your singleness under the microscope. And because you've got your singleness brought into focus, you can't see the completeness God has all around it. All the other stuff. You've got your wife's stuff on the, on the, on the Petri dish on the microscope. 
You're watching your wife's mistakes. You're watching your husband's mistakes. And you're scrutinizing it down at the microscopic level. You get the microscopic, microscopic and subatomic and molecular detail on their mistakes. And you're missing everything else God wants to do in you. You got to open your eyes. Your spouse isn't the only one who needs to change. Society is not the only one who needs to change. And everybody wants to change the schools. And everybody wants to change the political climate. But what would happen if the church quit saying everybody else needs to change and the church started saying, what do you want to do in me today, God? Right now, right here, how do you want me to change me from the inside out? We got to learn. We got to receive. We got to hear. And we got to see. Now the question is, what? And there's a list of things, starting with patterns. I believe Paul was giving patterns. If you're taking notes, write these things down. We are going to get patterns, traditions, doctrines, and I love this. I fought with whether or not to do this, whether or not to put that fourth one there. I fought with whether or not to put that there. One of the commentators that I read from, he put it there. And I thought, mm, man, I just, man, I don't want to make it about that because FYI, a wicked and perverse generation seeks a sign. God, that prayer, show me a sign, God. Well, wicked, wicked people pray that prayer. No, but show me a sign if it's, if it's pure in, its, in, its, in its, its request. God, please give me a sign. If it's, but that sometimes is coupled with, God, if you're really there, then, well, if he's not, who are you talking to, right? Who are you talking to? And... Why would God answer if you don't even know if he's standing beside you or not? So this, this thing, show me a sign. No, no, no. We don't want to say, show me a sign. We want to say, God, help me to walk by faith. You want to see signs and wonders? Well, then you walk by faith and not by sight. So we're not going to ask God, show me something. I want to see something. No, I believe something. And because I believe something, I'm going to experience something. Well, I was struggling with this because the whole thing about miracles, I'm like, you know, I don't want to overdo it on miracles because we believe in miracles at Discover Life. I'm like, I don't want to overdo it about miracles, but some of you need a miracle. Some of you right now need a miracle. You, you may have some, some a blood condition in your body. You need a miracle. You, the doctor may have given you bad news. You're not going to die in six weeks, but... You know, in the next 20 years, you're going to have a lot of struggles in your body. The doctor gave you bad news. Well, you need a miracle. Your, your spouse is ready to walk out the door. What do you need? You need a miracle. Well, here's the good news. Paul had a pattern of miracles in his life. And, and, and I was struggling. I was like, you know, God, should I put this in there? Well, I started looking up about Paul. And you know what? Paul had done so many miracles. Paul had done so many amazing things. Uh, and God had used him so supernaturally that at one point in the book of Acts, I believe it's Acts 19, they're taking handkerchiefs from Paul's body and sending it to people so they can get healed. Oh my gosh, how many have never heard that before? Lift your hands. You've never heard that before. That Paul the Apostle was so powerfully stirring the anointing of God and the gifting of God on the inside of him. Paul was so stirred up in faith and living for God so much that they would take, can you imagine someone taking your socks? I don't want your socks. I mean, you better be real anointed. You start uh, mailing me a pair of socks. You better be dang anointed. That's all I'm going to say. But they would take handkerchiefs and aprons and things that had been attached to Paul and they would send it to people and people would get well. Oh my gosh, how powerful is that? So Paul had, Paul, Paul taught people patterns. He, he gave people traditions. He, he spoke doctrines. Come on. And he showed people God, help us to get this. Well, if, if people are going to learn patterns, someone's going to have to teach them. Come on, I want you to see these things. Somebody's going to have, somebody's going to, have to teach them. If, if people are going to receive traditions, I'm not talking about church clothes either. Church clothes. What, what a... 
Church clothes. For years, people have lived so self-righteously and they have missed, watch this, you say, well, it's not really that big a deal if people want to wear their church clothes. Listen, what I'm saying about church clothes, I, I, by the way, I wear church clothes. I believe in church clothes. I have church clothes on right now. I'm in church and these are clothes. They're church clothes. The problem with a lot of people, the problem with a lot of people is that they define who they are by the clothes they put on. They ain't put on Christ since the day they got saved, but they put on a suit and go to church every week. Come on, they smell. <laughs> I'm not going to do it. I'm not, I'm not going to do it. Y'all will just never know what I was about to say. You're just never going to know it. And so, so there are traditions that we want to pass down. I'm laughing about what I was about to say. <laughs> there are some good, I'm not, there are some good traditions. There are some good traditions that we can give to people. And Paul passed these traditions down. Paul passed these traditions down. Somebody has to teach. Somebody has to give. Somebody has to speak. And somebody has to show. All right. I want to show you something. This is, somebody gave me a prayer request. I'm done. I'm going to close with this. Somebody gave me a prayer request today. And the prayer request, it was something along the lines of, I get a prayer request every Sunday. My staff uh, speaks with people. And people, people will send a prayer request. And so the prayer request that, that I got today was uh, wisdom. God, give me wisdom and greater depth and understanding. And someone asked me for that. And I want to say something to you guys real fast because we did some Bible study today, right? We underlined the lists and, you know, I taught y'all about how to read in your Bible and to, to dissect a scripture. Look at verbs and objects and nouns and pronouns. And just like you'd study grammar, study that in the Bible. And so anyways, uh, the thought occurred to me, I'm sure there are a lot of people here today who want wisdom and greater depth and understanding. And just by a showing of hand, how many would like to be wiser? All right. How many would like to be a deeper believing Christian? Lift your hands. All right. Let me, let me, let me share something with you. There is no greater depth than provided by loving God and loving people. If if you think depth is knowledge and information, you are a clanging cymbal, sounding brass, and you are nothing. You are nothing. You have nothing. But if you love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, you've got a chance. Paul said, all the law is fulfilled in this. Love your neighbor as yourself. If you live a life of loving people, that's when you're deep. All the other times, you're a freaking fake. And if you want wisdom and you want to go deeper in God, we'll find somebody to love before the end of the day. And I got one right now, and I don't want to. See, that's the problem. You have to ask, do you really want to go deeper? And most of you don't want to go deeper. You just want to sound spiritual. You just want to look the part. That's called being a Pharisee. So right now there's somebody you're supposed to love and your spiritual depth is being negated because you won't love the person God's calling you to. You can't grow, not because God won't, but because you won't. And if you will love him and if you will love people, then you can have spiritual depth. We've got single mothers, a single mother's a baby shower coming up. There's this, you know, the, the whole thing about abortion and pro-life and pro-choice. Listen, listen, I, I don't I don't I don't I don't apologize for having an opinion. I don't apologize for being pro-life, but I'm pro-everybody's life. 
And I, I think that what we need to do is love the hell out of people. And I'm not going to go to a, a street corner uh, near an abortion clinic and yell murderer at a 15-year-old girl who's scared out of her mind already. Her body's changing. And the guy she had sex with has left her and won't even talk to her, return her calls. And so she's freaking out and losing her mind. And she's got some idiot Christian person, some idiot church person screaming at her on the corner. No, here's the question. What does love require? So we're going to have, and we've already done this, and we're going to do it more and more and more. And I haven't forgotten about the home for mothers, and we want to do that. And part of our plan to get there is going to involve baby showers. And so we've already done a few of them, and I want to just show you some pictures. Here's some pictures of how this church had spiritual depth, how people in this church went deep in their faith. This, these are pictures of people, and man, I, I, wish I, could, I wish I could even begin to tell you, these are pictures of folks, all the gifts and things that we gave away, car seats, baby seats, keep going, and then, and then do me a favor, show, show them. I, I want to put up something on the screen for you to take a picture of, and it's a QR code that will just take you somewhere and give you more information about what we're doing. This, I believe, is what we learn and receive and hear and see. When we practice these things, I believe this is what God produces in us. Right here. Reach the region, Saturday, May the 6th. Reach the region. You want to make a difference in someone's life? You want to go deeper in your walk with God? Well, then love people not where you want them to be, but love them to the place you'd like them to be. Well, you can't love them in the journey if you don't love them where they are. So we, 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 don't, we don't say, well, if you want to be loved by us, then you come on over here to our side. And when you get on my side, then you can get love. No, no, no. We say, where are you? I'll come to you. I'll come to you. I'll walk with you. Bear one another's burdens. I'm not going to preach this, but literally it means, uh, one of the words is anakamahi. Another one is bastazda. It means to take, someone's, uh, to take someone's heavy load and carry it off. To stake yourself to where they are and say, I'm going to weather this storm with you. You don't have to weather this storm by yourself. I'm going to bear your burden. I'm going to stay here with you. Well, single moms need somebody to bear the burden with them. Mother Teresa said, bring me your babies. And she had the money to pay for them. <laughs> Promise you, the Vatican had money to pay for babies. She said, bring me your babies. What would happen if the church was so blessed? We could say, we put a sign up that said, bring us your babies. We'll take care of them. Not just your babies. You come here. We'll take care of you. The things that you have learned and received and heard and seen, practice these things. These, these, these doctrines, these patterns that Paul had, come on, he says, practice these things. And in a few weeks on, it's the first Wednesday, we're going to grow. We're going to go deeper. We're going to go deeper. We're going to understand the Bible better. It's coming up. First Wednesday, it's the, I think, the week before Easter. <clears throat> but I want to encourage you, everyone in this room, everybody in this room, cancel any other plans you have to come out, and let's go deeper. Let's pray together. Let's study the Word together. Everybody in the room, make plans to be here first Wednesday in April. Not this Wednesday, but the next Wednesday. Come on, can you all put that up for everybody to see? Everybody read this. First Wednesday, 6.30 p.m. Now, if you get here at 6.30 a.m., there ain't going to be many people here. 6.30 p.m., what is it? First Wednesday, 6.30. We have, a, we have a worship experience. We have worship. The worship team leads us. We go into the Word. We study the Word together. And we're going to be praying over our Easter experiences. Now, I, I, I'm just believing God to do miracles this Easter at Discover Life Church. That when people connect with what Paul was teaching, come on, birth, life, death, resurrection, second coming of Jesus Christ, that there's going to be some amazing things God does in their lives. No practice, no peace. If we'll learn how to practice, we'll learn to how to experience the peace of God. God, thank you for your presence in the room. We believe you're here 
God, wherever two or three are gathered together in my name, there you are in the midst of them. We believe you're here, and we thank you for being here. God, thank you for changing us from the inside out. In Jesus' name, amen.